What's up my friend, Abby here, and this is an episode highlight of The Kate and Abby Show. The Kate and Abby Show is a podcast that I do with my sister Kate. We sit down every week and talk about writing and creativity and living your best life. We have a lot of fun, we have some great conversations, and you guys often join in on the conversations by asking us questions, we answer your questions. It's a great time, but we get a little long-winded sometimes, and the podcast can be a lot to listen to in one sitting. So I had the idea to take episodes of the podcast and make them into highlight videos that will go here on this channel, on my channel, and deliver the best parts of the podcast to you. So taking our best content, the best points we made, the stuff that you can walk away with and actually implement into your writing life and your creative life, I wanna give that to you in a quick format because I know you're a busy person, you're a busy writer, you often don't have time to sit down and listen to a whole podcast, I don't either. So that is the purpose of these highlight episodes. I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, let's get into the first episode highlight, which is the interview Kate and I did with Dave Chesson of Kindlepreneur.com. Dave is the creator of Publisher Rocket, which is a software designed to help you make the most of your Amazon ads and your just your presence on Amazon with your book. Um, he knows so much about the Kindle store and just getting your book in front of your readers. So I want you to hear some of the most valuable information that he had to give on this podcast episode. Roll the film. What made you choose indie and how did that help you turn into the marketing Jedi that you are? As in what about indie got you deeper into marketing and what skills did you learn that you otherwise wouldn't have with a different publishing path? Yeah, that's a really good question. I a lot of it pertains to the fact that at the time that I decided I wanted to start writing, I was in South Korea. Um, times were really off. It, it was it would be really hard to find an agent. But more importantly, I also learned, too, that I had talked to a couple of publishing uh, friends who had published, and they started telling me exactly how much publishing companies would cut and some of the problems they ran into. One of the biggest things that I've learned now uh, having sat on the board of publishing companies, sat in meetings when they were deciding who to choose and who not to choose uh, to send a contract, is that uh, first and foremost, the I have found that, and I'm very lucky that I didn't experience it um, personally, but say, for example, this publishing company has 25 people they can sign for the quarter, right? So right. that's their magic number. The truth of the matter is they really only have the money and the time to to market two of the 25, I like fully, right? Now they're gonna give that to their star, you know, at least one of those spots. Uh, this person has published for them before, made a lot of money, or they have some reason to believe this person is truly uh, gonna be their, their, you know, their um, uh, bell cow, right? right? So sometimes it comes down to it's you versus 20, uh, 23 other people on who gets the attention of the publisher. And even more so, again, the more you have that backs the belief that you're the sure thing, the higher chance that you're going to be one of those 23. And I've learned that sometimes it, it doesn't even come down to who's the better read. Sometimes it comes down to exactly what you wrote. A lot of these publishing companies know full well that right now this particular trend in lit RPG is just taking off. You know, cultivation is the thing. And it just so happens you're the only one that that was a cultivation book out of the other 22. Um, you know, and so it could be just the understanding of the market. Another thing, too, is, is that we talked about sure things for publishing companies. One crazy part about it is that if I come in with, say, uh, you know, 30,000 email subscribers, they'll know that number. And that means that I have 30 or so thousand people that have enjoyed my writing that are ready to hear about my next book. That to them equates to money. So there's a lot of factors that are coming into a publisher selection period. And if I had started, I mean, let's just pretend I was a great writer from the get-go, right? If I had started with this idea that I was going to get signed from, from a publisher, there would have been a very good chance that I would have failed miserably, even though I was already a prolific writer. And we see that a lot. Um, J.K. Rowling's, uh, she got rejected 11 times by publishers until finally her agent pulled strings 
twisted the guy's arm and the guy threw the, the book to his 11 year old uh, kid and said, here, read the first chapter. Let me know what you think. Wow. And that's how Harry Par- Potter started. I mean, we're talking the greatest, biggest money making book uh, in our living history. And it was rejected over and over and over again. And finally, somebody was forced to look at it. Amazing. <laughs> so I don't really like to leave things up to chance like that. And I think yeah. self-publishing is an opportunity to take control and really dig in and learn and kind of be in, in, in the driver's seat of your own career. Yeah, for sure. That's so true. And that made me think of, I saw that kind of firsthand when I was, um, when I was publishing my first book last summer and I put it up on the site neck alley, which I'm sure you've heard of and Mm -hmm. probably used. And, um, I was noticing that it got really good, really high rankings in its category. So it was actually, it was number two most requested in teen and YA category for a long time, nice. for like several weeks. Yeah, so that was exciting. And I was noticing that the the first one, the one that was ranking number one, and then the one that was ranking number three were the only two books that I saw like really marketed highly and then also in bookstores. But like every other book on that first page, I didn't see anywhere after that. And I'm like, these books are obviously like they're traditionally published. They're all getting really good high rankings, but they were obviously they didn't have like a lot of promotion money to put behind those books. So I think that's a really good point that a lot of people don't think of is they just think like traditional published, they're going to market my book, but not necessarily. Right. And and another big thing that kind of plays into it, too, is, is that typically publishing companies will give will have this like mark in their mind that you need to make this many sales or so by this quarter. And if you don't hit that mark, then they almost like a lot of them stop returning your emails, you know, mm-hmm. and, and they stop their marketing efforts. And what's worse is, is that as a as a as an author, you don't have the ability to set up Amazon ads for your book. You don't have the ability right. to change keywords. You don't have the ability to touch it. It just sits there in kind of like purgatory. Um, yeah. And so that can be a really uh, hard thing for a lot of authors. So it's not that publishing or self-publishing is the answer. I, I prefer the self-publishing route. Uh, but more importantly, whether you choose either or, I think it's incredibly important that you still learn book marketing because you are going to have to do it yourself unless you won the lottery and you were one of those 25. You know, right. Or yeah. you just happen to, I don't know, uh, write a book that just takes off like crazy. I call them lottery winners. So, How important is it to already have a mailing list, to already have some of this audience collected this platform built before you're approaching publishers if you're going traditional and how does that work out for indie publishing as well it makes it so much easier uh like i said i have sat in the meetings where they've decided not only who they're going to sign but also who they're going to give their their backing to and the number one thing that i heard discussed was email subscribers uh to them that really is currency that equates to cash uh, mm-hmm. i i've I even have a, a buddy on his first book was able to get a initial uh, $200,000 uh, signing fee uh, for his first ever book. But he had over 200,000 email subscribers and he had done that by writing on Medium. So, I mean, he was a great prolific writer, but he had that was I that and a really good proposal were the two things that just drove it to that three out of the five biggest publishers were fighting over who would get him. And, mm. um, wow. and again, first book. So that email subscriber list, I think is important. The other thing that I've really seen shift over the past five years or so is that, well, even further back when I first started in self-publishing publishers looked down on self-publishing, they kind of looked at it like, mm. you know, like the scrubs, you know, the C team, uh, you know, these, these people that couldn't, couldn't hack it in the publishing world. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and right. here they are just getting their book out there. The thing is, is that wisely, the publishing companies have started to look at self-publishers as what I would call free agents. Um, you know, think of it like in, in baseball, right? You know, you've got your team and you've got a spot open. Why not turn to an existing pool where you see this list of authors that are self-published so they don't have a contract somewhere? They have a following. They have written books that have over a thousand, you know, five star reviews. You don't even need to read the book. You know, it's good enough that the market likes it. You know that they got their chops and you know they have an email list. That is a much better situation than somebody over here who's got nothing except a book that you're now going to have to read and subjectively figure out whether or not you like it. So they're really starting to turn towards 
sell publishers and try to recruit them out. And I think it's the best situation because most of the time, when they are trying to convince an author to come over, the deal is a lot better than if you're a no-name person getting your first opportunity. Um, you'll see that the contract is much better. So, mm, Yeah, that makes, that makes so much sense. Because sense. like, in one case, you have you're knocking at their door or they're knocking at your door. I'm always, I always saying that about like anything that I do. I'm like, I want them to come to me, (laughs) (laughs) which is, you know, it just gives you more time to get better at your game. And I'm sure that publishers are looking at that at rankings on Amazon, which I know you talk about a lot. And I see so many indie books now that are like number one, number one, number one in all their categories. I'm like, that's so cool to see that and to know that they're able to pull that off on their own. Yeah, it is. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this episode. If you are, smash that like button to let me know. We're gonna get back to the interview in just a minute, but first I wanted to say the reason why this this podcast is uninterrupted by ads and sponsorships is because of our amazing patrons. So thank you so much to our patrons who support this show, and if you would like to support the show, show us some love, as well as get behind the scenes access to cool bonus stuff, head on over to patreon.com slash the Kate and Abby show. All right, let's get back to the show. What is Publisher Rocket and how can it help in the publish in publishing a book and what are its best features? How can we use it to launch a successful Kindle ebook? Sure. Well, uh, the beginning or the purpose for creating Rocket was back in the day I used to really I used to break out a whole bunch of Excel sheets. I used to track uh, what books were doing, how they were selling, trends in the market. I also had this hardcore way to kind of figure out what the best keywords were for my books. And that was a major reason for for a lot of my book success. However, though, when you start trying to teach authors how to use Excel sheets and and, and have to track information and input data, it, it's, it's like pulling teeth and rightfully so. So that's when I got a, a bunch of programmers together and we basically started creating software that would help authors to understand the market. Uh, instead of just guessing at what keywords they should put, and instead of just trying to find the categories that they should select, uh, we wanted to create something that brings all that information to the forefront so that authors don't have to, have to spend the time trying to dig through it. One of my favorite statistics are, or pieces of numbers on Amazon is that there are over 11,000 Amazon categories, right? Wow. Well, now, when you go to publish your book for the first time on Kindle Direct Publishing, they have that pop-up box and there's the list and you can select from. But those are actually called BISACs. Those are not um, Amazon categories. Hmm. BISACs are an international standard categorization. Okay, It's actually really about supply chain logistics. The idea is that publishers, because they don't know what inventory or aisles certain store have, so what they do is they select their book and say, this book is a part of these two or three BISAC codes. Um, and then certain stores have in their inventory that all of these BISAC codes represent just fantasy, okay? Because this store only has 20 aisles of which one is fantasy. They don't have fantasy, you know, epic fantasy, um, right. you know, and I'm trying to, I'm blanking out on the others, you know, lit RPG, uh, sorcery, et cetera. They don't have those different outs. They just have the one. So their system will take the numbers and bring it in and say, oh, this book goes in the fantasy aisle. Well, Amazon does the same thing. So when publishers, as well as us, when we select the BISACs, they say, okay, great. Now there's only 4,700 BISAC codes, okay? There's 11,000 Amazon categories. So Amazon takes from the 47, parcels you into whatever they think, and then you just happen to be put in there. A lot of authors are finding out that Amazon's really doing a poor job. And when they actually look, they're seeing that their books are listed under things they shouldn't be. Um, others are doing that intentionally, but that's that's another thing. But the point though is, is that there's nowhere for authors to go to one spot and look and be able to see what categories they are, how competitive they are, how many people shop there, um, and that sort of thing. And so that's our category feature right there brings that to the forefront, lets you be able to quickly see all of the categories and choose the best one for you. And one of the things we're coming out with really soon, which I'm really jazzed about, is we're going to be showing historic category data. So now authors can also look at those 11,000, see the trends in the market, see what's selling and what's decreasing in sales and so forth. So a lot of it is basically making it easy for authors as well as publishers now 
to understand the Amazon market and make better decisions. How do you manage to like juggle everything that you do? So like everything with the business end of book marketing and for your own books and then also teaching it to others and also writing. Like how do you balance all of those things? Because that's a real challenge, I'm sure. I'm very intentional with my time. Um, Mm -hmm. One one thing I once heard, I was actually reading a book about... um, uh, being, being a father, right. Improving, you know, being a good father to your kids. And it always talked about the intentionality of your time. And in it, it said something where you can sit in a room with your children for three hours and get nothing out of it Hmm. for both of you. Right. Or you can just spend five minutes of being intentional about being in the room with your children. And it would mean the world. And if you think about it, you can sit and have dinner and nothing happens. You're there, you're present, you're, you're, you're physically there, but taking the time and asking them how their day went and truly engaging with them and not thinking about all the other things around you and what you just did at work or, you know, what's going on or what you're going to do. No, just focus on them and, you know, play a meaningful board game, put away your cell phone. And you will find that in those five or 10 minutes, we'll just say just five or 10 minutes, you will get so much more done as a father to your kids than if you just sat in the room for three hours. And if you take that same principle and you apply it to what you do and you're very intentional about the time you have, you will get so much more done. I think most authors feel worn out because they're spinning their wheels. They're spending three hours sitting in front of the computer, but they're not intentional about the time. Or they have assigned themselves this time period that they're gonna work. And when they sit down, they just don't know what to do. So I would say being intentional about your time and being protective of your time are very important. I make my writing time uh, still to this day. I still do it from four to seven. And it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. I'm doing four to seven and I'm writing. And then I have, I kind of break up my day like that. That's awesome. That's awesome. That I love that being intentional with your time. It's that's like so, so important to being productive, I think for sure. What would you say are the most important things to nail aesthetically about your book? So like book cover, book blurb, the things that like really just first hit a person when they start to look at your book. What do you think are the most important elements there? Well, I think the most important combination is your cover to title to subtitle. And what I believe is extremely important in the digital age is that um, is that there be a symbiotic relationship between the three and that they're able to answer two to three very important questions. Now, before I get into those questions, the first thing I'm going to say is let's take take all the listeners here through the shall we say the buyer's journey. OK, this will help to explain why those questions are going to be important. I'm a big time fan of, and again, we'll just stick to lit RPG because we've been talking about it a bit and maybe there are going to be more lit RPG readers after this, um, <laughs> but I love lit RPG. So I go to Amazon, I go up to the search bar and I type in lit RPG and it's L I T R P G. Okay. Now, and I have an, in my mind, this type of book that I want. Okay. I might not have put the rest of the words in. Okay. But I started with lit RPG. Now I'm going to scroll down the search results, right? When Amazon lists all those books in a row. And I'm going to, this is what's going to happen is my eyes are going to stare at the covers first. And when I see something that catches my eye, I'm going to quickly analyze it for what it shows me. And my eyes then move over to the title and follow through all the way through the subtitle. Here's what's really processing through that buyer's journey. Is this my kind of lit RPG? Okay. Okay. Or better yet, does it is this actually the right showing? Did Amazon show me a fantasy book or did they show me a lit RPG book? Okay. Um, what type of, and we're going to call this sub sub genre is this? Okay. And what I mean by that is, yeah, technically it's a fantasy, but okay, technically it's an epic fantasy, but all right, it's really a lit RPG. See, sub sub genre. And if your book doesn't convince me from the get go that this is my kind of, of sub sub genre, I'm going to quickly scroll on to the next book. I'm not even going to give you a chance. We are in this world where it's so much easier for me to scroll, 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 go back up, add another word or two to my search term and keep searching. Sometimes, all right, yeah, I'm going to click and that'll get to the next part of this answer. But the key is, is that if I'm not sure 
that this is my kind of thriller, right? Blood curdling, horrific thriller, or is it a wholesome detective thriller, right? If I can't gauge on exactly what level of genre this is, I will not give it a chance. So with that said, I think the lit RPG is a very important one because lit RPG, most likely it's a lit RPG game lit, which is usually somebody stuck in a video game. How do you make a cover that tells me that? Like, I mean, do you, I see the epic knight and he's swinging his sword against a giant berserker orc, you know, in a tunnel. All right. Well, that could be a lot of different genres. Okay. I don't yeah, even, that's a tough like one. inside a fantasy, right? Yeah. So, and then you put, um, say a title like Dungeon Lord. All right. Okay. So that's closer, but I still don't know. And this is where I would say the subtitle is very important. I say that it is a great idea to say epic game, uh, epic lit RPG and game lit fantasy. Now that's not stuffing keywords like a lot of authors will, you know, give the Heisman to, but what it does do is it, it, it reaffirms on my mind. No, no, no. This is the right sub sub genre. Okay. Um, there's a great example that I like to show people. It's a cover and it's got what's like a cowboy. I think, uh, it's kind of dark and it's shadowy, but there's this guy on a horse and he looks like he has kind of a hat. It could be a cowboy hat. We're not sure. And off in the sky up above, it looks like rampart slash, you know, um, uh, fireworks are blasting off. So I asked everybody and, and on the title of the book is called hitch. H-I-T-C-H. That's it. I'm like, great. Tell me what this book is about. Some people are like, oh, it's a, it's a lonesome cowboy, uh, probably a romance. Another person saw Civil War. That it's a civil war. That's why ramparts, you know, uh, blasting off in the air. Um, and, and some others thought that, you know, it was um, – uh, the key is, is that just looking at the title and, and the cover, nobody knew. Nobody got it right. It wasn't what it was. Now, that book – had an author who had a very large following. Okay. And, um, that's also when you start to see author names become bigger and bigger on a, on a cover, because when you see Stephen King, you know, what kind of book you're probably going to get into. Right? right. So that word Stephen King tells you everything you need to know. All right? right. But with that said, if you're not a known author, the name, the author name doesn't help. So in this case, what would have helped hitch is to put a little blurb to the right of it in the subtitle that says whatever that book is about, you know, uh, the sub sub genre. Is this a, a wholesome Western romance or is this a, you know, go through all the different types. But the point is, is that we really need to make sure that we don't confuse the, the shopper because when we confuse, we lose. Now, right. the next part is, is that once you convince the person to click on your book. They now have an idea of what sub sub genre this is. The biggest thing you can do is have a book description. Okay. That helps to sell the book, not tell them the story. And more importantly, that you constantly reaffirm in their mind, this is your kind of book. Um, if it's an alien invasion, epic sci-fi book or something, then you don't want to say that the, that the spaceships went into space to, to, you know, fight the Klandathu who have been ravaging other planets for years. No, no, no. You, you've missed so much of the epicness and the kind of words I want to hear. I want to hear in the intergalactic war for, you know, for civil peace, the Klandathus have ravaged, you know, planet and, and species after species. Last defenses is Earth standing in their way. But who will win in this epic showdown that will, you know, tell the fate of the universe? And I literally just spitball that. But notice that the words that I use were so much closer to my genre and how they would feel when they're looking for epic sci-fi military, right? right? Right. So it's really important when you tie in all those elements, you will have a much better sales conversion where more people will stop at your book, they will click on your book, and then they will click buy because you convince. And when you have those things out of sync, you're going to start to see that more of your efforts to get people to see your book, but less sales. This is where Amazon ads are really big is that when you set up Amazon ads, you can finally see how many people actually saw your book. You can see how many people out of that actually clicked on your book. And then you can see how many of those actually bought your book. And if you have a hitch in the system where the cover title is confusing or the book description really doesn't sell, then all of that effort to get people to see your book will not come to sales, which is the true fruition. And so I think this really highlights the point of making sure that that funnel 
that path for the for the shopper is that much more clear. And when you have it right, everything else you do, whether it's your email blast, other authors' email blasts, uh, social media, you name it, all of those things will show more sales. I hope you enjoyed that episode highlight. I hope you got a lot of valuable information out of it. Remember, you can find the unabridged, unedited version over on Kate's channel. Check that out right there. If you want more content, you wanna get dive really deep into this topic. Otherwise, make sure you hit the like button to let me know that you liked this episode highlight and that you wanna see more of them. Comment below, tell me if you wanna see more of them and hit the subscribe button because I post videos every single Wednesday about writing and publishing and I'm gonna be posting these episode highlights every week as well. So stick around for more valuable content on writing, creativity, and living your best life. Also, don't forget to share this video with a friend who's also into indie publishing and trying to get their book more visibility on Amazon. Until next week, my friend, rock on. Shh.